Good evening, everyone. Um, it is uh, 7 o'clock. I like to, uh, can everyone hear me okay? I'm going to turn the mic up a little bit. Better? 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 Yes. Okay. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming out again tonight for our uh, continued series of Forecasting Hope. Uh, tonight, we have another very exciting and also very important uh, topic uh, that's found uh, in prophecy. And it's all about the Antichrist. Um, but before we begin, as we always do, uh, the Bible says spiritual things are spiritually discerned, so we're going to have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we uh, are thankful again to be gathered here uh, tonight to study your word together. We just pray, Lord, that you would give us your Holy Spirit again tonight. You would bless us, uh, give us listening ears, guide me as I speak, and we just pray that your name will be glorified and that we'll be drawn closer to you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, we are going to, we kind of have a lengthy study tonight, uh, so we're going to skip over the theme song. I know we love the theme song, but we'll continue hopefully tomorrow. But we do have some Bible questions tonight. Um, we've been having Bible questions, but we haven't been getting too many. But the few that we did get, we've been, uh, the presenters have been answering them privately. But we had some good ones that came in last night, so I thought we would share them uh, with you guys all. Um, the first question was, uh, does, does the Bible speak on after-death customs, specifically cremation versus uh, burial? Um, that's uh, a question that a lot of people have. Um, it seems that people today are opting more and more to, uh, have to be cremated uh, rather than to be buried. Um, in 2020, in the United States, about 56% of people were cremated. And that's double the number since about two decades ago. And it's projected that by 2035, it'll be up to 80%. Um, and, you know, because there's lots of pros to being cremated, um, it's uh, much more economical, uh, thousands of dollars cheaper than being buried. It's also environmentally friendly. Uh, it takes a lot less real estate. Um, that's why in places like where I'm from in South Korea, where the land is a lot more scarce, uh, in 2022, about 92 percent of people were cremated in South uh, Korea. But what about the Bible? In the Bible, you see instances of both. Uh, typically, the norm was people were buried, and that seems to be the more honorable way uh, in, the, in Bible times. Uh, but there were a few instances where people were uh, burned or cremated. Um, but it seems to be associated with, um, uh, it's not very favorable in the Bible because uh, burning is associated with the judgment of God. And so, for instance, we see in the case of Achan, you know, he was called the troubler of Israel. And we see in Joshua 7.25, Joshua says to Achan, Why have you troubled us? The Lord will trouble, trouble you this day. So all Israel stoned him with stones, and they burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. And so his body was burned. But we also have a godly man. Remember Jonathan, he was a, one of the sons of King Saul. Um, you know, he was defeated by the Philistines and killed along with his father, uh, King Saul. And the Philistines, they dismembered his body and hung it on a wall. And some brave soldiers of Gilead, the Bible says, went and retrieved the body and they burnt it. Um, but it seems uh, other, uh, but most of the patriarchs like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph, they were all buried. And they had specific instructions of uh, where or how they wanted to be buried. We know Moses was buried, and Jesus was buried uh, in a tomb. Um, here, uh, speaking of Moses in Deuteronomy 34, 5 and 6, So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he, God himself, buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor. But no one knows his grave to this day. And so different example, but there is no explicit command in the Bible to bury or not to cremate. Uh, that's probably because it is not a salvational uh, issue. Um, you know, because some people think, if I'm cremated, will God be able to resurrect me again from the dead? 
But, you know, God is not limited in the earthly resources. You know, if you were cremated and sprinkled in the ocean, it's not like God is like, oh no, I can't find the material. Um, you know, the Bible says in Revelation 21.5 that he, uh, God says, Behold, I make all things new. And so God is going to take a new material. Philippians uh, 3.21 says uh, we're going to receive glorified bodies, new bodies in heaven. And so, um, and we know Christian martyrs in the past have been burnt at the stake. They've been eaten by lions, but God will have no trouble. And so really, uh, I think the bigger concern is what we do before we die, uh, then really after that we make sure we have a relationship with Christ. It's a great question. Uh, question number two is what does the Bible say of suicide? Is it a forgivable uh, sin? And of course, that's a sensitive topic. Um, and I believe uh, most of the cases of suicides are, are bad. Uh, it doesn't look favorable per for the person that committed suicide, but I would be careful to say that all cases of suicide are, are hopeless. Uh, but, um, you know, because uh, the Bible says, uh, the just shall live by faith. Um, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Ephesians chapter 2, 9 says, uh, we are saved by grace through faith. But if a person's last act of their life is complete hopelessness, complete faithlessness, and they commit suicide, it doesn't look good for that person. Uh, it reveals something about the heart, what kind of relationship they had with God. Um, but I, I believe we can't rule all suicides as a lost cause because um, God knows the heart. And there might be some instances where a person we don't know what happens in the last moments of their lives. And, and, uh, for instance, uh, a person might have been a Christian all their lives, and they loved the Lord, they were faithful to Him, but in the last moments of their lives, they go through some kind of trauma, and they're um, going through extreme grief, whether it be physical or, or painful, and there might be some chemical imbalance in their brains, and they commit suicide. God is going to weigh that out in the judgment and look at the true heart of the person. Uh, there are some people who, you know, I've heard stories where they take a bunch of pills and try to kill themselves, but immediately they regret it. And so, and they repent, they, they confess, but on their way to the hospital, they might die from the effects of the pill. Uh, we have people like Kevin James. He was the man who jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, but he lived to tell about it. And he said the moment his fingers let go of the rail, he immediately regretted it. And so we really don't know what happened in the last moments of someone's life. And so we can't rule them all as hopeless. So I think I, I, we should be careful in both ways. We shouldn't say that all cases of suicides are bad, but we also shouldn't encourage and say it's okay because most of the time, it's a rare exception that it might be okay, but most of the time it doesn't look good. And so we uh, don't want to encourage that. Um, and then the last question was, uh, what is that one unforgivable sin uh, which is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, and what does uh, this mean? And so what is that unforgivable sin the Bible talks about? In Matthew 12, 31, uh, Jesus said, Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, uh, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. And so Jesus means what he says, right? He says, every sin uh, shall be forgiven men. And that means... It might be murder. As bad as something like murder might be, God can forgive you. Um, were there people in the Bible that committed murder and were forgiven? Uh, Moses committed murder. He was forgiven. Uh, David, he committed murder and adultery, and yet he was forgiven. We think of uh, people like King Manasseh. He uh, killed the prophets of God. He had his own children pass through fire. And some people think, you know, killing babies, that has to be the worst of all sins. And yet we know King Manasseh was uh, forgiven. But the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. Uh, the unpardonable sin is not a single act of sin, but over time. Uh, and it is, not, uh, it is not necessarily the degree of sin that makes it an unpardonable sin, but any sin, whether it be small or big, uh, you, you keep doing it over a period of time where the Holy Spirit continues to come to you and convicts you. That's one of the jobs of the Holy Spirit, to convict the world of sin, and you continue to harden your heart to the point where eventually you harden your heart, you sear your conscience, and you 
don't feel guilty about your sin anymore. You don't hear the voice of God anymore, and that's when it grieves the Holy Spirit. Uh, he doesn't see the point of speaking to that person anymore because he can't hear him. And so he departs from that person. And the sin that you don't repent of, the sin that you don't ask for forgiveness, uh, God can't forgive that, and that is the unpardonable uh, sin. And so, um, great questions. I hope that um, helped a little bit. Thank you for sending those in. And please keep asking questions and putting them in the question box, and we will try to answer as we uh, go on uh, throughout through the presentations. But tonight, uh, our topic is Discover Revelations Antichrist. And so it, it is kind of a lengthy study, so I'm going to go rather quickly. So I hope that as I speak fast, they say you can uh, listen fast. Um, but notice, uh, in Revelation 1-3, as we're studying the book of Revelation, you know, there are many people, even pastors at churches, that say, you know, you can't understand the book of Revelation, don't read the book of Revelation, and some even say it's a curse. But notice what the book of Revelation says about itself. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy, of this book, and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. So there's a what pronounced upon those who read the a book of Revelation? A blessing. And that's because if you actually turn to John chapter 1, verse 1, the very first verse of the book, you know, many Bibles, the title of the book says, A Revelation of St. John. But that's really a misnomer because it is not the revelation of John, but chapter 1, verse 1 says it is a revelation of Jesus Christ. This book is a revealing of Christ himself, and so how can that be a curse, right? And so that's a blessing. Um, so, um, I've been thankful that we've been having this Revelation series, and I trust that we have all been blessed. But Antichrist, what is uh, Antichrist? You know, many people, when they hear the word anti, they think it means against, right? I am anti-abortion, or I am anti-war. But you know, anti, while certain can mean against, but there's also another meaning. Anti means in the place of. So Antichrist means someone or some thing that comes in the, that puts itself in the place of Jesus, of God. And so tonight we're going to look for something that seeks to take the place of God on earth and usurp his divine authority. And you know, the Antichrist is described in both Revelation chapter, Revelation chapter 13 as the beast power and also in Daniel chapter 7 as the little horn power. We're going to see that they're the same entity, and they're both uh, the Antichrist. And so the beast of Revelation chapter 13, the Antichrist, is it a person? You know, many people have thought uh, throughout history that Antichrist is a person. And there has been, uh, have been some bizarre speculations about who the Antichrist is. You probably have heard some. People have said in history, Adolf Hitler, he's Antichrist. Some have said Ronald Wilson Reagan is the Antichrist. And the reason they give is because Ronald, Wilson, Reagan, and each of his names is six letters long, 666, and they say he must be Antichrist. Some say Obama was the Antichrist because the day after his election in Illinois, they had the you pick three lottery and the numbers were 666, and they said Obama was Antichrist. Some have said David Hasselhoff of Baywatch is Antichrist. I don't know why, but <laughs> I just saw that online. And actually, I just recently uh, heard at a, at a meeting just like this one, a guest came, and the presenter had just presented about the Antichrist, and the person came uh, up to him with a straight face and said, you're wrong about the Antichrist. And he said, the Antichrist, and he was really serious, he said, the Antichrist is Procter & Gamble, uh, the manufacturing company. And he said, why do you think Procter & Gamble is the Antichrist? And he said, um, you know, their, their headquarters is located in Cincinnati, um, Ohio. And he said, you, see the, you hear the word sin, Cincinnati? Antichrist is a man of sin? And he wasn't kidding. He had a straight face and he really meant it. It's not even spelled the same way. It's C-I-N. <laughs> but it just goes to tell you how gullible people can be 
and the de devil doesn't have to work very hard to deceive people, and yet he is the master deceiver. And so there's lots of different theories and bizarre ideas about who the Antichrist is, but tonight we're not going to do any of that. But we're going to look straight to the Word of God and see, uh, without a doubt, uh, who the Antichrist, who the speech power, who the little horn power is. So is the beast an organization? Is it a person? Some think it's a, it's a religious power. So in order to get that answer again, we're going to look to Daniel and Revelation. These are those, uh, that, those companion books that go together like hand in glove. And first we're going to turn to Revelation chapter 13. And here we find that beast power. There's actually two beast powers, but we're only going to pay attention to the first one. Revelation 13, 1 through 9, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast arising up out of where? Out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns. And so this multi-headed uh, beast coming out of the ocean, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. So leopard, bear, lion, amalgamation of these uh, beasts. And the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, so it receives a deadly wound. But then it says the deadly wound would be healed. And his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed after the beast. So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshipped. So immediately right here we see the beast power, the Antichrist, is a religious power, right? Uh, it's receiving worship. Uh, worship the beast, saying, Who is like the beast who is able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for how long? So he would be in power for 42 months. Then he opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle. And those who dwell in heaven, it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And so uh, the beast power making war against the saints, against the followers of God. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb, uh, slain from the foundation of the world. I'm sorry, of the world. If anyone has an ear, let him uh, hear. And so uh, this, uh, this beast, obviously, uh, does the Bible really mean that in the last days there would be some, uh, this bizarre multi-headed beast that's going to come out of the water? Or is this a, a symbolic language? This is symbolic. Um, I'm sorry? Uh, symbolic. Um, and so we're going to uncover uh, that uh, symbol, and we have uh, been learning some of these principles in un uncovering a Bible prophecy and these symbols. So what does a, Bi a beast represent in Bible prophecy? And we turn to our companion book, Daniel. Daniel 7.23, the fourth beast, there, there you have it, the beast shall be a fourth kingdom. Do you see that? And so, and we see in verses 15 through 17, of, uh, the beasts that you saw were kings. So kings or kingdoms, it's a nation, a kingdom. And so right there we know that the Antichrist is not a person, but it's a group, it's an organization, it's a nation, it's a kingdom. So a beast represents a kingdom or nation on earth. So Antichrist is a kingdom or nation on earth that seeks to usurp, uh, to take the place of God, his divine authority. So a quick summary of what we read in that long passage. A uh, beast rises from the sea, uh, and waters, many waters, sea. In Re Revelation 17:15, we know that it's a symbol. That's another symbol of, of a populated area, uh, many peoples. Uh, it has seven heads and ten horns. Dragon gives the power, deadly wound that is healed. People worship the beast, blasphemes God, has power for 42 months, and persecutes God's uh, people. And here's that verse, 1715, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, and nations, and tongues. It would be in power for how long? 42 months. How long is that? That seems, uh, if you do the math, a three and a half years, awful short time for this Antichrist to be in power for. 
And so if you do the math, uh, there's in a Jewish calendar, there's 30 days to a month. And so if you times 30 by 42, 1,260 days. But we have been learning in our series that uh, in prophecy, a day, a prophetic day equals a literal year. And so really, uh, this uh, beast power would be a ruling for 1,260 uh, years. In other places in the Bible, it says a time times half a time, or 42 months, uh, three and a half years. They all, it's all talking about the same time period. It's kind of like saying, you know, I'm 5 foot 11 here in the U.S., but if I go to Europe, I'm 180 centimeters. Uh, it's the same height and different measurements. Um, and so going back um, to Daniel chapter 2, you know, we had, uh, we uh, studied this on the first night of the series where um, there's this prophecy of these uh, kingdoms, these nations that um, King Nebuchadnezzar uh, had in his dream and Daniel uh, uh, interprets it for him. Four medals, uh, the head of gold, and that was a symbol for which kingdom? Ba Babylon. Uh, chest and arms of silver, Medo-Persia, uh, belly and thighs of uh, bronze, Greece, Greece uh, legs of iron, Rome, Rome and then uh, Rome uh, would be divided into these uh, ten uh, tribes uh, of divided Rome, and that's symbolized by the divided uh, clay and the iron, and also the ten toes. Uh, and so it predicted the rise and fall of these uh, kingdoms, these four kingdoms. And so we see that in Daniel chapter 7, now we're going to move on to Daniel chapter 7, which is a parallel passage to Revelation chapter 12, and the same prophecy is repeated. You know, Chaplain James had uh, studied with us and said, in prophecy, uh, the same prophecy is repeated, but then enlarged upon. It gives us more detail the next time. And so in Daniel 7, 2 to 3, Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. Uh, and so you ha have, again, the great sea, uh, four winds, that's a symbol of conflict. And so in the midst of conflict, in the midst of many peoples, four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. How many beasts? And a beast represents in Bible prophecy Nation. nations. So we see it's a repeat of Daniel chapter 2 of the four kingdoms. And so we can then know um, that each of these beasts are a symbol of each of the nations that we saw. So the first beast that he sees in uh, verse 4, the first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man and a man's heart was given to it. And so uh, the first beast, the lion with eagle's wings, and this was a symbol for Babylon. Babylon, the premier of all the kingdoms, uh, the lion is the king of the jungle. And in the Bible, uh, the Bible even refers to Babylon as a lion. Uh, in Jeremiah chapter 4, 7, you know, God warns the people of Israel that Babylon will come to uh, conquer you. And we read in Jeremiah 4, 7, God, uh, the lion has come up, the lion has come up from his thicket and the destroyer of nations is on his way. He has gone forth from his place to make your land desolate, that's Jerusalem, uh, your cities will be laid waste without inhabitant. And you know, as we look to history too, um, you know, you see uh, archaeologists dug up from the ruins of Babylon. Uh, there were these uh, thoroughfares uh, that led to the palace of uh, the, the throne room of uh, the king of Babylon. And on the walls were these uh, glazed tiles that were in the shape of lions with eagle's wings. And you can see those at, at the Met in the New York City and other museums like Istanbul, all over the world, and so a lion. Yes? I have seen those in person. Oh, yes. Because they're, the uh, they're in the Berlin Museum, and they have it reconstructed, and I walked through there, and they look know, lions with wings. Mm. So. Amazing. Um, but, you know, eagle's wings, wings are also a symbol of speed, and Babylon conquered uh, very quickly and became the first of uh, that superpower. The next beast that he sees, Daniel 7, 5, and suddenly another beast, a second like a bear, it was raised up on one side and had, uh, you see those bones, right? Three ribs in its mouth between its teeth, and they said thus to it, arise, devour much flesh. And so the Medo-Persian Empire, um, they, uh, they conquered, they devoured much flesh. And in order to become the next superpower, they conquered 
uh, those three, uh, represented by the three ribs in the mouth, three principal nations, Lydia, Egypt, and Babylon. Raised up on one side, you know, Medo-Persia, uh, that name is a little unfamiliar to us. Really, historians say the Persian Empire, right? Uh, it was because the Medes and the Persians, it was a coalition, they worked together, but eventually, uh, Persia, uh, they become the more powerful, raised up on one side. Persia. And then a third beast. After this I looked and there was another, like a leopard which had on its back, how many wings? Four wings. And so a leopard, leopard is a quick animal, quick and nimble, but added on to that, you know, uh, the lion had two wings. Uh, the lion had uh, a six-cylinder engine, but here the leopard, he has a V8, uh, <laughs> turbocharged. Uh, and so very quickly, and uh, there was a symbol of uh, Greek, uh, Greece, uh, led by Alexander the Great. And he uh, conquered the then known world in about 10 years. Uh, conquered Persia in about three years, uh, trained under Aristotle, a uh, military uh, genius. But how many heads did the leopard have? Uh, the beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. And Alexander, he dies at a young age, at about 32 years old, and the kingdom of Greece is divided among his four generals, um, Cassander, Lysimachus, Ptolemy, Seleucus, and so just like the prophecy said, uh, the kingdom of Greece divided into the four heads or four parts. And then this nondescript uh, beast is the fourth beast. Of course we know that from prophecy and history that's the Roman Empire that would conquer uh, Greece and become the next superpower. And this I saw in the night visions, and behold a fourth beast and it just describes it as dreadful and terrible and exceedingly strong. Um, and Rome really was uh, very uh, cruel, strong, uh, ruthless. Uh, we saw the other night about the Colosseum where uh, they just killed people for entertainment. Um, it was in Rome where Herod, a Roman a king, governor, was uh, told to kill all the two-year boys of Bethlehem. Jesus was crucified during the time of Rome. Crucifixion was invented by them. Cruel nation. And it, and it was different. It had iron teeth. Uh, that's a direct parallel to the iron legs of Daniel chapter 2. Uh, it was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. And so far, it's a direct parallel to what we uh, saw previously in Daniel chapter 2, but now comes the enlargement, the additional information that we didn't see uh, previously. Um, and also, it had how many horns? Ten horns. Uh, that's the parallel to the ten toes of Daniel 2, the Roman Empire that was the fourth empire, but then it would divide it into the ten nations of divided uh, Western Europe. And so ten horns uh, here uh, is the ten kings of uh, divided Rome. And then we see in the next verse, in Daniel chapter 7, verse 8, here comes the little horn. This is the Antichrist. As I was considering... Uh, the horns, and so those were the ten horns, the ten divided nations of Europe, and there was another horn, a little one, and coming up among them. So it comes up among the ten divided nations of Europe, before whom three of the first horns were plucked by the roots. So of the ten divided nations, this little horn entity uh, plucks them out, plucks three of them, <laughs> destroys them, obliterates them. Um, it has the eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words. Uh, some versions say blasphemous words, and that's really what it translates to. And so who is this little horn power? Who is the Antichrist? We skip down to verse 23 to 25. Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which shall be different from all the other kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and trample it and break it in pieces. And I wasn't just making a guess about those ten horns being those ten divided nations. It says, the Bible says, the ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom, and another shall rise after them. He shall be different from the first ones, and shall subdue three kings. And so just repeating the same uh, identifying characteristics. He shall speak pompous, blasphemous words against the Most High, that's God, and he shall persecute uh, the saints of the Most High. So that was what the beast power was doing, right? It was speaking great blasphemies against God. It was persecuting the saints of God. 
And how long would this power be in rule four? Uh, high and shall intend to change times and law, intends to change the law of God, then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. Of course, time is a year, times uh, two years, half a time, you add that up, three and a half years, 42 months, 1,260 days, or 1,260 uh, literal years. Um, so just a summary of the little horn power. Do we see that this is uh, the same power as the beast power of Revelation 13? The Antichrist. And so these were the ten divided nations of Europe, uh, the Franks. Uh, these are ancestors of what we today know as modern Western Europe, the Franks. They would become France. Anglo-Saxons, they would become England. Alemanni, they would become the Germans. Lombards, the Italians, uh, and, and so forth. But three of them, interestingly, just like the prophecy said, the Ostrogoths, the Heruli, the Vandals, you know, they were opposing forces to the little horn power, to the Antichrist, and they were, what did the Bible say? Plucked up uh, from their roots. And so they don't exist anymore today. And we're going to talk more about that as we go on. over this. So, now we're going to take, uh, as we read at, uh, in that passage, Revelation chapter 13, and also about the little horn power in Daniel chapter 7, we're going to gather 13 clues, or identifying points, uh, so that uh, after we gather that from nowhere else but the Bible only, and then we're going to look to history and to see which power in history fulfills all 13. You guys ever play the game Guess Who? You know, I play that board game with my niece, and she's five years old, and she loves that game. She's just getting it. She's just learning how to play it. Um, before, it was frustrating to play with her. <laughs> um, but, you know, that game, I have that board, and, you know, my niece has that card with that, her person on it, and I ask her some identifying characteristics, right? Uh, does your person have uh, glasses? And she says, no. And then I put down all the, uh, the pictures that have glasses, right? And then I'm left, I'm, my selection is now a little bit more narrowed. And I ask her, does your person have black hair? And she says, yes. And I, t I put down all the ones that don't have black hair. And I keep doing that, and as I go, the goal is, I'll have one left. And there is no question that that person is what my niece has, and based on the identifying clues. And that's what we're going to do here today with the Antichrist. We're going to look at these identifying clues, and we're going to look to history and see, we're going to narrow it down and see there is only one. There might be some that, you know, fulfill one or two here or, or one or two clue here, but there's only one uh, power that fulfills all 13. And so are you guys excited? So point number one, clue number one, we find this in, uh, I'm going to go through these uh, rather quickly, the little horn, the any power would rise to power after 476 AD. This is because, remember, uh, the little horn had to come after the fourth kingdom, which was the Roman Empire, and Rome fell in the year 476 AD. And so it has to come up, uh, oh, I went ahead, right, didn't I? It, it comes out of Rome, and so it comes out of the uh, fourth beast, uh, it was the ten horns that came out of the, that dreadful beast of uh, Daniel 7. And then the next point is it, the little horn power would rise to power after 476 AD. And so after Rome falls in 476 AD, it would have to come up. Point number three, uh, the kingdom is represented by a little horn. It will be a little kingdom, not large in geographical size. So it's a little one, a little kingdom. Number four, the little horn conquered three kingdoms that came out of Rome. And so this Antichrist power will conquer those three, uh, the Heruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths, uh, these opposing forces, uh, pluck them out. Uh, clue number five, the little horn had eyes like a man and a mouth that would speak for it. And so there would be a man at the head of this Antichrist power uh, that would uh, speak for it. And so it would have, we know that uh, the Antichrist is not a person, right? It's, a, it's a, a nation and a kingdom. There would be a man at the head of it, though, a leader. Um, so that's our next clue. Little horn would be different from the other horns. So in some way, this kingdom will be unique and different from all the other European nations. 
And we already know a little bit about that. All the other European nations, they are uh, political nations. They're just uh, civil states. And yet we saw earlier in Revelation chapter 13 that this would receive worship, right? So it's going to be a political nation as well as a religious power. The little horn would speak great words against the Most High. We saw that it's translated into blasphemy. In uh, Revelation 13, it actually says the word blasphemy. And so uh, this Antichrist would speak blasphemy against God. But what is blasphemy? Here we have a dictionary definition, but really we want to go to the Bible and what is the biblical definition of blasphemy. For time's sake, we're not going to read these verses. Actually, we might. Um, in uh, John chapter 10, uh, 33, 31 to 33. Now Jesus, the Pharisees, the Jews of the day, is uh, accusing Jesus of committing blasphemy. Uh, Jesus was saying, uh, I am God. I am the Son of God. I am equal with God. He said, uh, before Abraham was, I am. I am the eternal. I was eternal forever with the Father in heaven. And the Jews said, you being a man, you claim to be God, that you commit blasphemy. Right? And so a definition in the Bible for blasphemy is when someone, a mere man, uh, uh, claims that he is God. Of course, Jesus did not commit blasphemy because he really was God. In Luke 5, 21, a uh, similar thing, uh, Jesus said, I forgive sins. And uh, the Jews said, only God can do that. You being a man, you, for you say you can forgive sin, that's blasphemy. Of course, Jesus could forgive sin because he was God, but Another definition, when you are a man and you're not God, but you claim that you have the power to forgive sin. And this Antichrist power will uh, commit, uh, speak blasphemy against God. The little horn would make war against the saints. It would be a persecuting power of Christians, of true followers of God. It was uh, clue number eight. Clue number nine, the little horn would seek to change God's times and God's law. And so um, it says it would seek to change because um, you can't really change the law of God. We, we already heard that, right? Uh, uh, before heaven and earth will pass away, uh, not even one tittle, not even one uh, comma or punctuation of my law will pass away. That's what Jesus said. Point number 10, uh, the little horn would rule for a time, times, and half a time. So this Antichrist would have to rule for 1,260 years. Uh, by the way, the, the little horn power, the Antichrist, would come into full power after 476, but it has to be the year 538 AD, which is still after 476, because the last of the three, um, the last of the three nations that opposed the Ostrogoths, they were conquered uh, in 538 AD. And so if you calculate 538 from that point, 1260, that's sort of how we get the outline of time. Clue number 12, people follow and worship this beast. The whole world will wonder after the beast, the Bible says, and so um, Antichrist will have the world following after. And then point number 13, for point number 13, we're going to look here at the end of the passage in Revelation chapter 13, or the number of his name, here is wisdom, let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. So calculate it. Uh, do, do some math. Do some addition. Right? Uh, the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. And so, you know, many people have the misconception. They think 666 is the mark of the beast. But upon just careful reading of the Bible, it says 666. While it has to do with the mark of the beast, it is the number and not the mark. Um, and you know, people think have uh, qualms about this number, right? They think it's some evil number. They don't really know much about it. Sometimes they don't even know that it's from the Bible, but they say 666. I always tell this story. I used to work as a cashier at a dollar store, and sometimes a customer would come, would ring them up, and the, uh, the total would come to $6.66. And they go, oh no, oh, let, let me grab a chapstick. <laughs> Do you need chapstick? No, but I don't like this number. And so, um, but 66, there's nothing, you know, evil about just the number. You know, if you happen to uh, your, your bill comes to $6.66, just pay for it. There's nothing wrong with the number, but it's an identifying marker of the Antichrist. Does that make sense? Yes. 
<laughs> I just heard that in, uh, I forget where, but I think in somewhere out west coast, there's a highway that used to be called Highway 666. And they said um, it had a higher number of accidents on that highway uh, more than any other highways. But it wasn't the number. It was, uh, I think, near uh, some uh, drinking place or something. So a lot of people were driving and drinking. That was a reason. And eventually they changed the uh, sign. Yes? Just in case for people who are afraid of 666, one of the incomes of King Solomon was 666 talents of gold every year. That's true. Um, so the beast, here's clue number 13, represented by the number 666, it will be the number of a man and the number of his name. Thank you. So uh, now we have those identifying 13 clues, and now we're going to look to history and see which, uh, which power, which group is the Antichrist that fulfills all. And before we see, I'm going to tell you already, oh, does anyone have a guess already based on what we have so far uh, discovered? Yes. The Vatican. The Vatican, the papacy. And you know, you are in good company when you, uh, when you say that. Uh, virtually, uh, all of the uh, Protestant reformers like Luther, uh, uh, John Huss, uh, Wesley, they all pointed to uh, this beast power, the Antichrist, as uh, the papacy. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church. And before I go through uh, and see if these points do, if the papacy does fulfill all 13 of these clues, I want to hasten to add that this is not any individuals that are in the Catholic Church. We're not talking about any Catholics, any individuals. There's been many wonderful uh, Christ-like, God-loving, God-fearing uh, Catholics uh, throughout history. And we expect to see many Catholics, millions of Catholics in heaven, but this is talking about the system, the teachings, the, the office of leadership, the papacy, and not the individual. So, and by the way, the word beast is not a demeaning term. Uh, it's just, you know, we use it today, right? The United States, uh, we have the eagle, right? Uh, the Russia, uh, we use the animal bear. England, lion, and so um, even Jesus, um, he's referred in, in the Bible as the Lamb of God. Um, I'm going to try to remember, there's a lot, a lot of similarities between uh, the Lamb of God and the beast of Revelation 13. And you might wonder, what? How can that be the Antichrist? But similarities, but they're not the same. But for instance, the, uh, the Lamb, Jesus, he comes up out of the water. When he was anointed as Messiah at his baptism, he came up out of the water. And the beast power comes up out of the water. Uh, Jesus was uh, mortally wounded. He, was, he received a deadly wound, but is, he is healed. He is resurrected. The beast power receives a deadly wound, but he is resurrected. Um, Jesus, how long was his ministry? Three and a half years. The beast power rules for three and a half years. Um, and Jesus seeks worship from the world. The beast power seeks worship from the world. Uh, Jesus uh, uh, wants to uh, lead others to him, and so does the beast power. And so a lot of similarities, and that is because the beast power, the devil is imitating Christ. He is a counterfeit. And that's really what all of this any, uh, any Christ uh, topic is about. It's over worship. Who receives the worship? The real, the true God, or a false God? In Daniel chapter 3, um, after King Nebuchadnezzar he, uh, receives that dream of that statue, well, he makes a counterfeit in Daniel chapter 3. He makes it all gold. Yeah. Uh, and he causes everyone to worship him, right? Um, but uh, they, he said, when you hear the music, when you hear the instruments, come and bow down to this image. And so everyone, the whole world followed after that command and worshipped them bow, bow down, except for the faithful few, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they would not bow down. Even though they were threatened to be thrown into the fiery furnace, uh, they would not bow down because it was against the word of God. It was against the law of God. And did Jesus deliver them? Yes. Uh, Jesus was with them in the fiery furnace. Um, and so... Um,
So we're going to see now, uh, does the papacy, does the Roman Catholic Church fulfill all of these 13 identifying points? The little horn rises out of the fourth beast, which is Rome. The papacy rose out of the Roman Empire. Here's a uh, quote, Abbott's Roman History. The transfer of the emperor's residence to Constantinople was a sad blow to the prestige of Rome, and at the time one might have predicted her speedy decline. The emperor of Rome, Constantine, moved uh, its capital to Constantinople, modern-day Istanbul. Um, and it seemed as though Rome was uh, dying, but um, later another uh, emperor by the name of Ju uh, Justinian, he gives power, uh, he gives full authority to the bishop, to the Pope of Rome, and he says, here, you take charge of Rome now, uh, you be the next ruler, and Rome lives on, but not as the Roman Empire, but now the Holy Roman Empire or the, the Roman Catholic Church. And so here's the pastor. He has control over the whole, uh, he has both religious power and civil power. But the development of the church and the growing authority of the Bishop of Rome or the Pope gave her a new lease on life and made her again the capital, this time the religious capital of the civilized world. Here's a quote from Leah Banca. Uh, he, she's a professor of history at the University of Rome. And she says, to the succession of the Caesars came the succession of the pontiffs, that's popes, uh, in Rome. When Constantine left Rome, he gave his seat uh, to the pontiff. And so, uh, fulfillment number two, the little horn rises to power after the Roman Empire collapses, which is uh, 476 AD. The papacy rose to power, what's that year? 538 AD. And so 538 AD was when Emperor Justinian uh, gives uh, uh, that full authority. He gives the Bishop of Rome, he's a pastor, but gives him an army. And now the Pope, uh, as the Bishop of Rome, he has the power, he has the full authority in the Roman Empire. If anyone uh, goes against the teachings of the church, he has now the power to take away your house, he has to take away your food, he has the power to imprison you, and ultimately he had the power to kill uh, anyone, anyone who went against the church. Does the Bible say in Revelation ch chapter 13 that that history will be repeated? That beast power would receive, uh, would be healed of its wound, and anyone who doesn't worship or follow after it, first they will not be able to buy or sell, and then they will be killed. And that says that in Revelation 13, 15, and 16. Uh, the Coming of the Global Fascist State by Robert Wettergreen. The legally recognized supremacy of the Pope began in 538 AD when there went into effect a decree of Emperor Justinian making the Bishop of Rome head over all the churches, the definer of doctrine, and the corrector of heretics. Who really is a definer of doctrine? That's God, and his word has authority, and yet uh, now uh, the bishop, a man, has, is a definer, and he can call anyone uh, uh, a heretic. A History of the Christian Church, Volume 3, page 327. Uh, vigils ascended the papal chair uh, in 538 AD under the military protection of Belisarius. So, they, he also received an army to, to back him up. Uh, fulfillment number three, the little horn would be a little kingdom. Uh, Daniel said it was a little horn. And the papacy, you know, it is the smallest country in the world. It's an independent state, its own nation, but only 109 acres big. Uh, about a little less than 900 citizens. And yet, uh, they have their own, uh, um, Vatican City has its own currency, uh, they have their own military, the Swiss Guard, they uh, have their own postal code, they have their own rail railroad station, their own telephone service, and for such a small country, and even though it's such a small country, and really it's just a, supposed to be a church, and yet, uh, such influence over all the world. 177 sovereign countries around the world, they have formal uh, diplomats, official relations with the Vatican. And you see, even though really the Pope should be just a pastor of a flock, such influence. There's uh, a current President Joe Biden. Uh, everyone goes to meet with the Pope. Everyone shakes hands with the Pope. There's Joe Biden shaking hands with the Pope. Former President Donald Trump shaking hands with, the, uh, with Pope Francis. Uh, Barack Obama 
Uh, and they always seem to show this posture of reverence towards the Pope. And uh, he is shaking hands with also the Pope. Um, and so, of course, uh, in, it was in 1929 through the Lateran Treaty, uh, they were given uh, that independence. Uh, they uh, received that, the Vatican City as uh, an independent country, one of the most wealthiest uh, institutions in the world. Uh, just the gold that they have is estimated to be in the billions, uh, and that is not counting in all the treasures that they have, all the arts, all the silvers, and all the cash, and all the investments that they have in uh, different banks. And so, very wealthy, and yet it's a, a church. Um, did Jesus say something about, uh, was Jesus rich? Point number four, the little horn would uproot three of the kingdoms that came out of Rome. Uh, the, uh, so the papacy conquered the three opposing uh, nations, Heroli, Vandals, and Ostrogoths. And, you know, one of them was the Vandals. And, you know, those Christians, they saw that uh, the church now had a lot of idolatry. And they saw from the word of God that that is against one of the laws of God. Uh, you, shouldn't have, you shouldn't bow down to any idols. And so they went around and they... Uh, knocked off arms off of Roman idols and statues, knocked off the nose, knocked off the heads, and you've heard of the word today, vandalism. And that's where it comes from, from the vandals. Uh, clue number five. The little horn had eyes like a man and a mouth that speaks, and the Pope, uh, the papacy, has the Pope as its head who speaks for it. Of course, the prophecy is only talking about the office of the Pope. We're not talking about any individuals, right? Um, and so, you know, some, uh, they learn this prophecy and they want to hate the individuals, but we don't want to do that as Christians. We're talking about the papacy, the office. Do we want to pray for uh, leaders like this? If they maybe are, are, they don't know the truth of God, we want to pray. And just like King Nebuchadnezzar, he didn't know God, and yet Daniel labored for him and prayed for him. He was converted. And so we want to make sure uh, it is, again, the, the leadership, the, the office, the teaching of the institution, not individuals. But the Pope, he has absolute executive, judicial, political, and religious power over Vatican City. Clue number six, the little horn would be different uh, from the other kingdoms. The papacy is a different kingdom. It is both a religious system and a political power. Um, the little horn, uh, the Antichrist, would speak words of blasphemy. And we again learned earlier that a man claiming to be God here on earth, or a man claiming to, be, uh, to have the power to forgive sin uh, while he's just a man, and does the Catholic Church, do they fulfill this uh, point? And I'll let, the, uh, I'll let these quotes uh, speak for themselves. Here's um, a quote. Um, by a uh, Franciscan canonist, Lucius uh, Ferreris. Uh, the Pope is of so great dignity and so exalted that he is not a man, but as it were, God and the vicar of God. The Pope is called most holy because he is rightfully presumed to be such. Hence the Pope is crowned with a triple crown as king of heaven and of earth and of the lower regions. Moreover, the superiority and the power of the Roman pontiff by no means pertain only to heavenly things, to earthly things, and to things under the earth, but even over the angels. Doesn't the Bible say angels were created a little higher uh, than humans? Then whom he, he is greater, so that if it were possible that the angels might err in the faith or might think. So angels might make errors, uh, but they could be judged and excommunicated by the Pope. Uh, the Pope alone deservedly called by the name most holy because he alone uh, is the vicar of Christ. The Pope, as it were God on earth, sole sovereign of the faithful of Christ, chief king of kings. Name reserved for Jesus. Um, doesn't the Bible also say, don't call anyone on earth father? And yet we call priests and leaders of the uh, Catholic Church uh, father? Uh, uh, here's a, another Catholic publication. Uh, seek where you will throughout heaven and earth, and you will find but one created being who can forgive the sinner. And you would think that is God or Jesus. Of course, he's not created. 
who can free him from the chains of hell? And that extraordinary being is the priest, the Catholic priest. The priest not only declares that the sinner is forgiven, but he really forgives him. The priest raises his hand, he pronounces the words of absolution, and in an instant, quick as a flash of light, the chains of hell are burst asunder, and the sinner becomes a child of God. So great is the power of the priest that the judgments of heaven itself are subject to his decision. Here's Dignities and Duties of the Priest. This is a book that all priests training to become a priest must go through. God himself is obliged to abide by the judgment of his priest. God is subject to the priests and either not to pardon or to pardon according as they refuse or give absolution, the sentence of the priest proceeds and God subscribes to it. And here we have a picture, um, that's Pope Francis, and he's sitting on a throne. And notice what's next to the throne of the Pope on either side. Those are angels. Uh, we, uh, you know, when El uh, Jeffrey, he gave the presentation on the sanctuary in the, in the most holy place, where the Shekinah glory, or the presence of God, the mercy seat is, on either side were cherubims or angels. Uh, that seat uh, next to the angels belongs to God, and here uh, the pontiff, the bishop, is sitting on that throne. Um, by the way, um, do you know who was the first person? Uh, just to uh, again show, show you that we're in good company as we interpret prophecy this way, the very first person to say that uh, the papacy is the Antichrist. That's what I thought too, but I recently learned that it was the Pope. Uh, Pope the Gr Pope Gregory the Great, he said, uh, you, you've given too much power to us. You're making us God. And he called uh, that position uh, Antichrist. And here's that text about the Antichrist. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4. The Bible says, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin, the Antichrist, is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And many Christians today think that that's going to be sometime in the future, uh, the, the temple of God will be rebuilt, uh, and uh, the Antichrist is going to show and be, sit on top of that temple. But it's not a physical temple, that temple will never be rebuilt, but the temple that the Bible speaks of is really the Christian church. Uh, we are the living stones, right? The Bible says. Uh, Jesus said, Your bo the body, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. It is the Christian church that is that temple. And we see uh, that the Bishop of Rome has, uh, is sitting in the middle of that church, uh, setting himself as a God here on earth in God's position. Uh, a clue number eight. The little horn would make war against the saints. Uh, history attests that the millions of people were martyred by the papacy during the Dark Ages and the Reformation. Uh, here's a quote, the history of the rise of the spirit of rationalism in Europe, that the Church of Rome has shed more innocent blood than any other institution that has ever existed among mankind will be questioned by no Protestant who has a competent knowledge of history. And so you go uh, to Europe uh, and I'm told that you go to all these churches and you go to the basement of the churches and uh, torture chambers. The church, if you went against the teachings of the church, the church persecuted. Uh, the little horn would think to change God's times and law. Um, did that happen? Uh, the Pope is of great authority and power that he is able to modify, declare, or interpret even divine laws. Uh, but the Bible says in Matthew 5, these are the words of Christ. He said in verse 18 and 19, For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Deuteronomy 4.2 says, You shall not add to the word which I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. And yet here it is, uh, a man uh, taking away, changing, uh, thinking to change the law of God. Uh, these are, uh, as found in the Catechism, the Catholic version of the Ten Commandments. 
got rid of the second commandment because you know, the church gets into trouble when you have the second commandment of idolatry. Don't bow down to idolatry because there are so many idols in the church. And so, but they have to make get 10 because nine commandments just doesn't sound as good, right? And so they take the, uh, the covetous commandment, splits it into two, and it makes it uh, 10. Uh, we read this the other night, the Converse Catechism of C Catholic Doctrine. Uh, uh, they say, a which is a Sabbath day? And the Catholics answer, uh, Saturday is a Sabbath day. Why do we observe Sunday instead of Sabbath? Because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. Um, and here, a cardinal uh, says, you may read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and you will not find a single line author authorizing the sanctification of Sunday. The scriptures enforce the religious observance of Saturday, a day which we never sanctify. Really, the context of this is the cardinal, he is challenging the Protestant believers. He's telling them, you call yourselves Protestants. You are saying you protest from the mother church you have left our side, and you say sola scriptura. You are going by the Bible only, not by the traditions of the church. But he's saying, if you are really doing that, like you said, then you would not be keeping Sunday holy, because that's something we made up. Uh, just by uh, fo following the Sunday and observing that day as your holy day, you're really not going by the Bible at all. You're going by the authorization of the church. And so, you know, some people ask, why do you make such an emphasis over a day, right? Why, why is that so important? But it's one of the Ten Commandments of God, and really it's deeper than just a day. It's really a matter of worship. You know, Cain and Abel in the Bible, they both worshiped God, didn't they? They both came to God and they both worshiped Him, but Cain was rejected, Abel was accepted. Because even though they both worshiped God, Cain brought fruits, even though the commandment was to bring uh, an animal, uh, which was a symbol of what Christ would do. He would shed his blood to save uh, sinners. And so even though they both worshipped, one did it God's way, one did it according to man's way. One was accepted, one was rejected. And so the same thing, the Sabbath, the commandments, it's all about how we worship God, but how do you worship him? Do you worship him according to man's tradition? Are you going to listen to man's authority? Or are you going to listen to God's authority? Who do you trust? Where is your allegiance? And that's what it's all, all about. Amen. Uh, clue number nine, the little horn would seek to change God's times and law. And we see that the papacy has done that. Uh, clue number 10, the little horn power would rule for 1,260 years. And so if we uh, calculate uh, from the uh, 538 date, count to 1,260 years, come to the date 1798. Well, what happened in 1798? Uh, during the French Revolution, uh, Napoleon, he sends his general Berthier uh, and they capture the Pope of the time, takes him into exile, and he, uh, he dies. And uh, the world saw that day as the end of the papal power. Uh, the, the Pope, uh, who had that full authority, that civil power and religious power, he was taken as captive and they lost now that power. And so here it is. And just don't take my word for it. Uh, here is a secular source, the Encyclopedia. This is just history. Uh, Encyclopedia Americana says, In 1798, he, Berthier, made his entrance into Rome, abolished the papal government, and established a secular one. Clue number 11, the beast would receive a deadly wound that would be healed. In 1798, the papacy lost its power for a short time uh, during the French uh, Revolution. So we just saw that. But that wound would be uh, healed, uh, we read in Revelation chapter 13. Uh, and we, actually, we read that here, uh, that it was mortally wounded, but that deadly wound was healed. And notice, pay attention to that language, biblical language, that deadly wound was healed. And um, ironically, uh, the secular paper in 1929, when Mussolini, he made that pact, he shook hands with uh, the Vatican, uh, with, the, the, with the papacy, saying, um, you help me, you support me, uh, spread my uh, fascism, then we will give you the Vatican City as an independent state. And they agree, they shake hands, and that was the Lateran Treaty. 
And uh, a secular paper, the San Francisco Chronicle, writes about uh, that event. The Roman question tonight was a thing of the past and the Vatican was at peace with Italy in affixing the autograph to the memorable document, Healing the Wound. There's that biblical language. Extreme cordiality was displayed on both sides. And so uh, the healing of the wound has taken place. Uh, and it wasn't just the political healing of the wound that took place here at 1929, but do we see that worldwide influence of the Catholic Church today? Uh, do we see that wound, that spiritual wound being healed today? Uh, we saw earlier, the Pope, the papacy, they have worldwide influence. And, um, you know, just before the 500th year uh, anniversary of the Reformation, uh, Pope Francis met with uh, the Protestant leaders, uh, well-known Protestant leaders, and they shook hands and they said, uh, the protest is now over. And so, just to show you some pictures here, there's Francis Pope. Uh, you know, secular journalists say that he is one of the most active popes ever in history. And there he is on the top left. He's shaking hands with a Mormon prophet. And on the right, he is shaking hands with uh, the Russian Orthodox leader. Uh, bottom right, uh, that's uh, even Islam. That's the leader of the Islam uh, faith. And here is that meeting where he, uh, he met with um, uh, Protestant leaders. There's Kenneth Copeland. And is unity a good thing? Didn't Jesus pray for unity? Uh, he did. And here, Kenneth Copeland, he quotes John 17, 21, that prayer. He says, after that meeting with the Pope, he says, I am so blessed. Uh, what Jesus uh, asked the Father for in John 17, 21, that we may all be one in him. Unity is finally coming to pass. Pope Francis is a man filled with the love of Jesus. All eight of us in our meeting together with him were moved by the strong presence of the Holy Spirit, and our love for one another was strengthened beyond measure. What a time to be a believer. And what a time to be a believer today. Um, even though, yes, Jesus prayed for that unity, but God wants us to worship him in spirit and in truth. Uh, there can't be true unity unless there is unity in truth. You know, truth is very precious, uh, very important. The, the Protestant reformers, they stood up for that truth and they gave their lives uh, for the truth. And if they saw Protestant leaders today joining hands uh, with the Catholic Church, even though that uh, hasn't been resolved, they would be rolling in their graves uh, for what they gave so much for, and here yet, uh, they're, they're shaking hands. Of course, we learned last night they're not rolling in their graves because they're dead, they don't know anything, right? There's no knowledge in, in the grave. So we're almost finished. Uh, point uh, number 12. The beast would be a religious power that is followed and worshipped. The papacy is a worldwide religious power with great political influence. Is the world following after the beast today? Uh, here is a picture uh, from 2015. Uh, here's the Pope, again, a pastor. He is addressing the U.S. Congress. And he also, in that same year, uh, gave an address to the United Nations, the U.N., uh, the world, truly. Uh, wondering after the beast power. And the last, finally, a point, uh, the beast would have the number 666. It would be the number of a man and the number of his name. And, you know, the Pope, the, uh, the Pope his title, he is the Vicar of Christ. And in uh, Latin, uh, that's Vicarius uh, Filii Dei. And we all have used Roman numerals, so the V is 5 and IV is 4, or, and VI is 6, right? I get that confused. But if you uh, do the Roman numerals and calculate the Latin title of the Pope, and you add all them up, you get the number 666, the number of a man, the number of the beast. So I hope that was clear tonight. Did we see that the papacy uh, truly fulfills all 13 identifying characteristics that we took straight out from the Bible? Um, and just very quickly, I know we're a little bit over time, but um, again, we're in good company. All the Protestant reformers believe the same way as they studied these prophecies of Revelation. Martin Luther, the leader of the Lutheran Church, he said, we here of the con are of the conviction that the papacy is the seat of the true and real Antichrist. 
John Kelvin, he says, some people, some persons think us too severe and censorious when we call the Roman pontiff Antichrist. But those who are of this opinion do not consider that they bring the same charge of presumption against Paul himself. Um, John Knox, Knox wrote to abolish that tyranny which the Pope himself has for so many ages exercised over the church and that the Pope should be recognized as the very Antichrist and son of perdition of whom Paul speaks uh, in, the, in that text in Thessalonians that we read. And then just one more, uh, John Wesley, he is the founder of the Methodist Church. He says, speaking of the papacy, he said, he is, in emphatical sense, the man of sin as he increases all manner of sin above measure. And he is too properly styled the son of perdition as he has caused the death of numberless multitudes, both of his opposers and followers. And the quotes are a little longer, but I'm just, for time's sake, just reading portions of the quote. And so we are in good company. All of the reformers, they all used to believe the same thing. And so, uh, last questions. What does this have to do with my life today? You know, Revelation 13 talks about how history will be repeated. The beast power will regain that power again and force the whole world to uh, follow after and receive the mark of the beast. And he will make that counterfeit way of worship and force you to worship it. And if you don't follow suit, you will first not be able to buy or sell and eventually you will uh, have to give your life. But you know, we don't have to be afraid. Uh, just like uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, they didn't worry uh, whether they were going to follow God or not. Uh, they knew that God would deliver them, but even if not, they loved and trusted God and they went into that fire. And again, was Jesus with them? Jesus promises us, I will be with you until the end of the age. When we trust in God, put our trust in Him, and we follow Him, that uh, Jesus will be with us. There might be some trials and tribulations, but Jesus will take care of His children. Amen? Amen. And so I know we read a lot, but this is the final quote of the night. Education, page 57 by Ellen G. White. The greatest want of the world is the want of men, men who will not be bought or sold, men who in their inmost souls are true and honest, men who do not fear to call sin by its right name, men whose conscience is as true to duty as a needle to the pole, men who will stand for the right though the heavens fall. So I want to be among that faithful few that is true to God, true to, uh, uh, that stands up for the truth. Would you like to be a part of that group too? Amen. Amen. Uh, why don't we, uh, since we're talking about standing up for the truth, why don't we stand and have our closing prayer uh, together? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your truth and that, uh, as the Bible says, thy word is truth and it sanctifies us. And Jesus said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And Lord, we're so thankful to give us that truth that Jesus gave his all, that Jesus gave his life, you gave your all, so that we could, Lord, uh, be carriers of that truth. And we just pray, Lord, that you'll help us to love you and trust you with all of our hearts, and that we will give you all of our hearts, and that we will, Lord, as Revelation says, follow the Lamb wherever He goes. There might be hardships and trials, but we trust that you will be with us until the end of the age, and that you will not let us be harmed, and that you will give us the strength to be faithful, but Lord, we just want uh, to follow you. We want to, be, we want to stand up for that truth, the truth of God. And so please, Lord, we pray that you'll bless us and guide us and keep us close to you so that we may among that faithful few when you uh, do come back soon. Thank you, and we ask this tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, thank you so much. Yes. Yeah, it's my understanding all popes, you've seen all uh, that, that big hat that they wear, right? right? And on that they have an emblem, and on that it's the title of the pope, the vicar of Christ, and it's on that. So that's uh, the stuff. Right. And again, it's it not the end. It doesn't matter about the time of year that we're at, or the time of the revelation that we're at right now. Right. And so it is not the individual popes, it's not just pope, it's not pope Francis the individual, but that office, that, that the papacy, 
the system. The system, right. The system of the piece. I thought that was like maybe converted to Pope Francis's name. Yeah. Well, thank you. Great question. I, uh, that probably cleared it up for a lot of people. So. Thank you. Are you able to go back to like the number eight? Yeah. This one? Thank you. Oh, such it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Great. Um, thank you. Uh, tomorrow night, uh, we're going to have another great presentation, and that's going to be, I understand, it's on the second piece of Revelation 13, all about the, oh, I won't spoil it, and Jeffrey will um, present that for us.